Good morning to you again. It is 1039. We have five and a half, six minutes uh, until we begin promptly at 1045. Uh, this is coming to you from New Hebron Missionary Baptist Church here in Little Rock, Arkansas, where God has blessed me to be the pastor for over 14 years. And my name is Rodney Smith Sr. So we'll give you a few moments as you log on just to greet one another, just to say hello to everyone as we get situated and we get started for our sermon series that we've been going through for the last month now, entitled The Hard Realities of Serving the Lord. And there are some things that we need to accept, that, need to, that we need to embrace as a part of our journey that just come along with serving God and just come along with serving God. So... Let's make sure that we get ready. We're going to be in two different books this morning. Uh, good morning to you, Sister Jackie Brown, Sister Turner. Good morning to you. Brother Tidwell, good to have you. Good to see you. Good to be with you again. I thank uh, God for all of you re returning back from Sunday school. And for those uh, of you who weren't able to be with us this morning, thank you for being with us right now. You can see behind me the glare coming through the uh, curtains I have, the drapes, I guess you would say, even on an overcast day, even on a cloudy day, with the sun being I don't know how far away from the earth, even on an overcast day, it still has the ability to make a glare on a camera such as this. What a mighty God we serve. <laughs> that set all of these things in order, set all of these things in motion. It just shows a testament Another testament, I would say, to the power that God has, his creative power. So if you don't mind, when you come on, just greet everyone. Uh, Sister Lucretha Brown, good morning to you. To the Tim's family, good morning to you as well. I had to refill my uh, Maxwell house. The other had gotten room temperature and not too familiar, too comfortable with cold coffee. Not coffee that's not supposed to be cold, so... I had to refill my coffee there. Uh, Sister Verdi Davis, good morning to you. Once again, we're going to be in two separate books. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 3. Good morning, cuz, Tanya, you and John. Uh, Genesis chapter 3. And we're also going to be in Ephesians chapter 6. So we're going to kind of look through God's word and go through God's word. And I'll tell you this, I, I, I really enjoyed the uh, Sunday school lesson, that time of going through God's word together. I really did enjoy it. Uh, I kind of cut my teeth. I did my growing and my maturing through learning the Sunday school lesson at, at Macedonia, uh, the great teachers, uh, the now Reverend Stewart, who was Deacon Stewart, uh, his father, Deacon James Stewart, uh, just being in those classes and uh, Deacon Bosley, oh my goodness, Deacon Beeler, Deacon Terry Thomas in there, Deacon Wines, all these individuals who played a part in shaping me, Deacon Harold Walls, uh, I mean just all these men and those men class that just stood tall and they took Sunday school seriously and it just instilled in a young person like myself at the time to take God's word seriously and Lord, when they gave me the, the privilege I believe, of teaching the men's class. Now, you got to understand this. This is the men's class. All the deacons were there. You could, oh, man, on that first Sunday, everybody would have their ties on, the first Sunday ties and the black suit, and they would pull you to the side. Wouldn't embarrass you, but they would tell you if you studied. They would tell you, that, no, 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 you, you didn't study that lesson. No, 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 no. They would, they would let you know if you were on the right track or not. And I had to have a few of those. If you were late to Sunday school and you were teaching, hey, they would just give you a look when you walked in. No smile, no nothing. They would just look at you. And it was just a, just a silent reminder of what you should do, what you should be, where you should be, so to speak. So the Sunday school, nonetheless, has played a part in really shaping me and molding my theology, along with so many others. And so... Welcome to you, uh, Miles Robert. Good to have you with us. God bless you. Welcome to all of you again. Once again, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 3, and we're also going to be in Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, please be mindful at the conclusion of our Sunday school lesson that we're going to be observing the Lord's communion, a uh, time where we can reflect and look back at the price 
that Christ paid for our salvation. And so at the end of our morning message, we will have our communion service and we'll be going through uh, that together, hopefully. Sister Spearman, God bless you and good morning to you as well. I'm going to go ahead and get everything lined up here and prepared. And so we've made it to 1045 and we want to be respectful of everyone's time. 10.45 is our beginning time, and we want to uh, show you we appreciate you for coming on early that we can begin on time. So if you can pause what you're doing, let's have a moment of prayer before we go into the Word of God together. Heavenly Father, uh, our God, our Savior, we thank you, uh, we honor you, we magnify your name. Lord, you've been good, you've been kind, you've been fair, you've been just. You've treated us the way we deserve to be treated. In fact, God, your grace and your mercy has stayed your hand so many times in so many situations. This morning, we come, Father, under the heading of learning about the reality of serving you. Sometimes our mind gets off track and we think it's going to be all honey and no bees. Not that all of our uh, time of walking with you would be harsh or difficult, we don't want to have a pessimistic outlook, but we still want to understand, Father, to accept the good and the difficulty that come along with being your servant. We pray this morning that you can remove anything that would claim our attention. Help us to give you our full attention. Help us, Father, to look deeply and seriously into your word. And we don't want to be what James called hearers only. We want to learn your word to be doers of your word. We ask you, Father, in Christ's name, that you would assist us in doing this. In Jesus' name we pray. And they all said amen, amen, and amen. Um, our sermon series is entitled uh, uh, The Hard Reality of Serving the Lord. The Hard Realities of Serving the Lord. That's been our sermon series this morning, this particular sermon is entitled, A Call to Biblical Manhood. A Call to Biblical Manhood. Uh, I'm not going to in any way to men, young or older, uh, be disrespectful. Uh, but what I am going to do is take the liberty because I'm speaking specifically to men, in general to everyone, because God's word is for everyone. But because I'm speaking deliberately to men, I'm not going to be disrespectful, but I will be direct. I think the only way to get past an issue is to point out the issue. The only way to get better is to point out where we've gotten off track. And our lesson this morning is, is titled, A Call to Biblical Manhood. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 3. We're going to emphasize verse 9 and verse 17. Genesis chapter 3, verses 9 and 17. And of course, we'll have to put these verses in context. We'll also be in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. So Genesis 3 and 9, Genesis 3 and 17, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. I won't read these verses. I'm just going to ask you to please place a pen there. That way we can be ready when we get there. And here's why I'm uh, titling this sermon a, a call to biblical manhood. Uh, because as a whole, as men, Christian men, we must do better. The church doors are open to all, to the ones that are saved. And we certainly want to invite those that are not saved. We want you to get to know Christ. We don't want to, as it were, continue preaching to the choir. But it seems to be such a disparity in the numbers. And what I mean by that, there's so many women at the church, it almost looks like a feminine organization. I say feminine just because there's so many women, the absence of men is noticeable. And at the church, if you're not being taught, if you're not being discipled, if you're not growing, if you're not being trained, then what kind of 
father, grandfather, son, uncle, husband are you turning out to be? I, I believe that God gives us boys. He gives us children, women, boys alike. But I'm speaking specifically to men. He gives us boys. Because before they were godly men, Moses, Aaron, David, Joseph, Joshua, the, the list goes on and on. Before they were godly men, they were boys. Somebody had to teach them. Somebody had to train them. Somebody had to disciple them. Somebody had to sit them down and show them what the word says, how God expects us to live, how the Lord desires for our lives to give him glory. But what do we have now? And I'm only going to call the negative. Not that this is the sum total of all men, certainly not Christian men, but it seems to be more of uh, 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 at the forefront than it should be. You have now men that won't work. You have men that refuse to do for themselves, but they'll lean on mama, on grandmama, on sister, on girlfriend, on whomever else. Men that refuse to take accountability. Men that are absent from raising their children. I mean, yeah, they'll pick them up. But as soon as they pick them up, they'll drop them off somewhere else. I, I, I was reading a story about Terrell Owens or watching a video. He was raised by his grandmother. He didn't know for all of his life, his biological father lived directly across the street from him. Men that won't be involved in their child's lives. Men that won't take a stand for what is right. Men that won't defend their family, defend their home, defend their children and or their wives. We see these men now that are driving the girlfriend's car while she's at work. And we think this is just a young 18, 20 something. No, 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 no. There's some grown men doing some of these things. And we need to have a biblical call, a call to biblical manhood. We need to calibrate this thing. We need to set this in order. Because as a man, you can't lead where you haven't gone. You cannot teach what you don't know. We even have this thing now where men, I saw some football player attacking abusing physically. I don't, I don't know if it was his girlfriend or his mother and throwing her into a television. The, these men that are abusive to women, like this, this type of stuff has become normal. Men that are absent in their child's life. These things are more and more commonplace. And friends, it shouldn't be. Just because it's normal, just because it's common, it does not mean that it's right. So what does God's word have to say about it? Forget my opinion or your opinion. What does the word of God have to say about it? We'll turn to Genesis chapter 3. We'll look at how the Lord has structured everything. And we talked about this chapter briefly, I believe Wednesday, in one of our Bible questions. So some of this information may be somewhat repetitive. But it says the serpent was the most subtle beast of the field in which the Lord God had made. And the first words he said in the garden to Eve is, Yea, has God said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The first words he spoke was challenging what God's word says. Now in verses 2 and 3, we see Eve's response. Her response is almost verbatim. She adds a little bit to it, but apparently Adam, who received these instructions about what tree they were not to touch, Adam was given these instructions by God before Eve was created. Eve knows these instructions because Adam apparently sat down with his wife and shared with her what God had shared with him. And then we see the the climax of Satan's trick in verse 4. He directly contradicts what God says. 
at the end of verse 4, he said, you shall not surely die. In other words, what God said or what I said, you make a choice. And what I say contradicts what God says. And then he even fills in the blank just in case there's any holes left in her theology. He inserts in verse 5 what he wants her to know. Not only shall you not die, but he cast dispersions or a negative look on the character of God. You see, God just knows, Genesis 3 and 5, that in the day that you eat of this tree, your eyes will be open and you'll be like him. You'll be like a God knowing good and evil. And according to the next verse, he was successful in his attempts. It says, when the woman saw that the tree, it was good for food. It was pleasant to the eyes. A tree desired to make you wise. She took of the fruit. In verse number six, she did eat of the fruit, and here comes the problem. The failure, the fall of humanity was the failure of the man. She ate and she gave to her husband. In the King James verse, those next two words are very important. With her. Adam was right there the whole time. And he did eat. And we know the rest of the story. Their eyes were opened. They knew they had done wrong. They recognized that they were naked. Verse 7 says they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. This is the first example of self-righteousness. A man-made attempt to make yourself presentable to the Lord. And when they heard the voice of the Lord, verse 8, Walking in the garden in the cool of the day, Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. Now, I want to pause and we're going to stop at verse number nine. We see the scene, the setting, the context. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said, Adam, where are you? Not to both of them, Adam and Eve. Not to the serpent, what have you done? I'll get to Eve, I'll get to the serpent. But he called to Adam. The reason he called to Adam was because Adam is the one who he gave the instructions to face to face. It didn't matter what Eve said, how Eve was tempted, how Eve tried to lean on him and persuade him you knew exactly what my command was. You knew exactly what my instructions were. I told you exactly what to do and what not to do. And you have transgressed. You've gone away from what I have told you to do. And because Adam was the spiritual head, God called to Adam. Adam, where are you? Not where are you in the sense of send me a pin drop. Let me know your location. Get on Google Maps and share with me so I can find you. God knew exactly where they were. He knew exactly what they had done. He wasn't asking this question so that God himself can gain information. I can't find you. I'm looking around. Where are you? It was to awaken the mind, the heart, the conscience, the spirit of Adam. Adam, look at where you are. Where are you? It's a way of saying, Adam, what have you done? Adam, look at what's happened. Look at what has happened because of your failure to lead. Now, I don't want to offend the sensibilities of any women on here. Let me say this. This is not, the Bible does not, nor does God condone male chauvinism. Many people have tried to attack the Bible by saying that God is male chauvinist or, or it's a male-dominated society and, and, and the Bible doesn't apply now like it did then or Paul was a male chauvinist. No, ma'am, no, sir. That God, The Bible does not condone that at all. You can even look in Ephesians chapter 5 when he talks about marriage. It talks about loving your wife like you love yourself. It talks about loving your wife like Christ loved the church and he loved his the church so much, he died for the church. So the fact that people have misused the Bible 
to represent male chauvinism does not mean the Bible itself is in error. It means the people who are using the Bible are using it erroneously. The Bible has been used to condone slavery. Listen, if a person misuses the Bible to condone something that God does not condone, the fault does not lie in God. It lies in the people who are using it improperly. So the Bible does not condone male chauvinism or male dominism, uh, a domination. No, it doesn't. No. But God said, Adam, you are the head. Adam, I left you in charge with a major responsibility. Adam, you did part of it right, but you still failed in a bigger portion. You knew what I said and you allowed her to lead you when you should be the one leading her. That's why he calls out in verse 9 to Adam. They respond in verse 10. Uh, I heard your voice. I was afraid. I was naked, so I hid myself. And God says, well, who told you you were naked? <laughs> oh, okay. So apparently you've done what I've commanded you not to do. You've eaten from the tree that I've commanded you not to eat of. And then we get to... The age old verses 12 and verses 13, really verses 12, everybody starts deflecting. The man said, the woman that you gave to me, <laughs> she gave the fruit to me from the tree and I did eat. And God said to the woman, what have you done? She said, it wasn't me, it was the serpent. We still have that stuff going on today. And God punished Satan. He punished the serpent. It goes further. I'll put enmity between thee and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and it shall bruise your head, verse 15, and you shall bruise his heel. Basically, it's a prophecy saying how the seed of the woman, a reference to Christ, is going to be ultimately victorious over you. Verse 16, to the woman, he said, you know what? I'm going to greatly multiply your sorrow and conception. He said, in sorrow or pain shall you bring forth children. Now, at the end of verse 16, he's saying that this will be the battle of the sexes. Your desire shall be to your husband, and he shall rule over thee. It's basically not saying that the man is supposed to be the ruler over a woman. You have to look at the wording and put this in context. He's saying there's now going to be a cat-dog fight between both of you all. There's going to be a power struggle between men and women. You can't tell me nothing because you ain't my daddy. Woman, be quiet and do what I say. That type of nonsense is now what has come into the world as a result of sin. These power struggles, these leadership struggles between husband, wife, men, and woman, they are a result of sin. We're stopping at verse 17. Because when it came to Adam, when he gave this punishment, this is the only punishment. Before he gives out this punishment, he gives a commentary. And he, God said, uh, and unto Adam he said, because you hearkened unto the voice of your wife and has eaten of the tree, which I commanded you, saying, don't eat of it. Because of that, cursed is the ground for your sake. Let me back up. He said, here's why you're being punished. You're being punished because you listened to your wife. Pause, stop, keep the understanding. This is a text that does not, does not, it does not mean that a husband can't listen to his wife. You cook and clean and do what I said. No, nope, no, nope. that is male chauvinism. That is wrong. You can't do that and love her like Christ loved the church and die for her. You can't do that in Ephesians 5, the end of that chapter. Love her like you love your own self. No man ever hated his own self, but he takes care of himself. You can't be that person and be a male chauvinist at the same time. So we have two opposing understandings. And male chauvinism is not supported by God, by scripture, and certainly not anywhere in the Bible and not by this text at all. It doesn't mean that as a husband, 
you got the final say and you smarter than she is. You inherently know more than she knows. You're inherently wiser than she knows. So you don't listen to her at all. She has no say in the matter. Of course not. It does not mean that. Well, what does it mean? He's saying because you listen to her over me. Because you allow what she said to override what I said. You see, that's what got them in the fall in the first place. Because Eve allowed what Satan said to override what God said. And listen, this doesn't have to be a husband and wife context. It can be anything. If you listen to anybody over what God says, then you have a lapse in judgment and you're setting yourself up to fail. If you listen to me over what God says, if you listen to any minister, any preacher, any deacon, any pastor, if you listen to any person and do what they say over what God says, you're setting yourself up to fail. In the context of scripture, God says, I'm going to punish you. I didn't tell, I didn't go into this with the serpent. I didn't go into this with Eve. I'm going into this with you. The reason I'm punishing you the nucleus, the genesis, the source of the punishment came because you listened to her over what I said. You let human voices override a divine voice. Men, it's hard to be a godly father. Oh, don't let nobody fool you. When you love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, you're trying to be the husband God wants you to be. You're trying to be the servant God wants you to be. You're trying to be the father God wants you to be. And as you are setting and responsible for the spiritual temperature in the home, you should be the one leading them to church, not sending them. You should be the one that's teaching the kids. Not that your wife doesn't or she can't, but you ought to be involved in that as well. Because ultimately, God holds the husband the spiritual head responsible for the spiritual temperature of the home. And if it's low, if it's lax, if it's negligent, if it's drifting away, he ain't going to say, Eve, where are you? Plug in your wife's name. He's going to say, Adam, where are you? Plug in your name. And that's hard because you have all of these. Listen to me. To all my fathers, my godly fathers, my Christian men out there, when you begin to make decisions and you and your wife pray and you guys and y'all make decisions for your kids and for your home and for this and for that, you get a lot of chirping voices coming in. Everybody has an opinion on what you should be doing in your home. People will talk to your wife. No, you ain't going to take that. What? what you mean? He said, what the girl? I wouldn't. Or, or they'll, they'll, people will give you as a man, they'll give you, you better than me. I wouldn't be running home because my wife said such and such, and you checking on her. You, you get a whole lot of voices. You get a whole bunch of human voices. Don't listen to those voices above what you know the word of God says. It's always good to take wise counsel. It's always good to take biblical counsel from someone that's gone down the road a bit further or someone that may have a bit more experience and nuance with a situation you're going through. Doesn't mean you're stubborn and hard-headed and closed-minded, but it does mean that the authoritative source is not Eve. And Eve could be anybody, your wife, or it could be any person. The authoritative voice on how things go don't come from man. It comes from the Lord. And when you become a man that is unyielding, Listen to me now. Let me finish. When you become a man that does not compromise, when you become a husband that's going to do what God says, when you become a father that says, I don't care what the world is doing. My daughter's not leaving here dressed like ladies of the evening. I don't care what your friends are doing. You're not leaving here with your pants down around your ankles. I don't care what's in or out in culture. I'm not letting you go to school half-dressed or letting you do this or do that. When you have and all of these decisions are based on what the Bible says. And you put that into your home. And when you become that type of man, the Bible has a way to describe you. That's called a godly man. Yes, you know when to bend. You know what decisions to make for your particular child. 
Nobody knows the temperament of your child better than you. Nobody knows the obedience level of your child better than you. So when you make a decision or you and your wife make decisions on how you're going to go forward in this situation and that situation, be careful about listening to other people over listening to the Lord. Too often, we don't even have a father in place to even make a decision. He's asleep on the job. He's filling in the blank, doing whatever, but what he should be doing. But just because you forsake your responsibilities as a godly man, as a godly father, as a spiritual head, just because you forsake those responsibilities does not mean God has let you off the hook. He still holds you accountable to be the father, the husband, the biblical man, the servant that you should be. Just because you don't do them doesn't mean the whole game is over. God said, no, no, no. That still is held to your account. And from Genesis 3, we can see the Lord gave Adam the responsibility of being the spiritual head in his marriage. We need biblical men leading and creating, structuring biblical homes. We need men that are accountable to God because there's no such thing as a perfect man, perfect woman, perfect son, perfect daughter, perfect husband, perfect wife. Doesn't exist. But can you at least be trying? Can you at least be pushing? Can you at least be saying, Lord, I know this ain't in order, but help me with that and let me get better at this. There ought to at least be some effort being put forth. And here we can see God he came and he called for Adam. Adam is the spiritual head. God, even when he handed out punishment, he said, listen, I'm punishing you because you listen to your wife over listening to me. You did what you knew you were not supposed to do. She could at least say, well, I got it from Adam and secondhand information. You don't even have an intermediate, uh, 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 a middleman. I told you directly, you knew what I expected and you still allowed yourself to be walked into it. Now look at what has taken place. You used to have to tend the garden. Now you have to work overtime. You have to till the ground by the sweat of your brow. It's going to be hard work for you. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Very familiar passage, but we still want to put it in context. In Ephesians chapter 6, in our verses 4. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Fathers, he says that word. This could be mother and father, parents even. Some translation may have the word parents. But the more accurate have the word father. Well, why fathers? I mean, mothers can't raise children. Of course they can. I thank God for the mothers who have to be mother and father. For whatever reason, trying to teach their children the Bible, raise them the right way, give them a biblical base to stand on so that when they're older, they get out into the world and got some kind of theology to lean on, disciple their children. Thank God for the mothers who are doing that. But God places this responsibility on the backs of the father as well. And here Paul, Paul is saying to the fathers, as it relates to raising your children, first of all, you got to be there. Stay with me. First of all, you got to be right there in the home. Or even if you're not in the home, even if you do have a child that's across state lines or in another city, in another home, and you, you got involved in something and didn't work out, however it came to be, that still doesn't mean that you abandon your responsibility as a father. You still are held accountable by God for teaching your child, son or daughter, about the Lord. Listen, fathers, and when you raise them, when you teach them, he's saying don't break their spirit. Contextually, in the Greek and the Gentile culture in their homes, a father ruled with what I can call diplomatic immunity. 
A father could sentence a family member to death. A father could beat a woman and nothing could happen to him. A father could beat a child and nothing could happen to him. They ruled in the average home that's not governed by Christ. The average Jew, the average Gentile home in this ancient culture, the fathers and husband ruled with little concern of the wife and the children. Here Paul is saying, now that you're a Christian, now that you're saved, now that you are spirit filled, now that you have a new life in Christ, you don't live the way you used to live. I know everybody around you is not concerned about their wife, what she feels, not concerned about their children, how they feel. But as a Christian man, as a biblical man, that's not you. Mm -mm. Fathers, don't break their spirits, but raise them up in the nurture and discipline of the Lord. The responsibility of nurturing children in the faith is fixed squarely upon the shoulders of the Christian man. You see, let me tell you something. We see a whole bunch of kids doing a whole bunch of stuff nowadays. We see kids involved in all kinds of stuff. Kids at church, they barely come if they do come, and kids that are disrespectful and rebellious and things of that nature. Our children are falling away, not necessarily because something is wrong as church, but oftentimes our children are falling away is because you're expecting the church to do what God has placed on the backs of the family, specifically on the fathers. We need biblical men. I forget the phrase, but it's a technical term to where when you have a stock and you remove that stock and you cash out, and then when you don't keep it in that market and it begins to rise, the money that you missed out on, it's a specific phrase. I forget the name of it. I think it is a shadow cost or something like that, but if that's the wrong phrase, please forgive me. But many families are paying what I would want to call, the term may be incorrect, a shadow cost. So much that sons have to go through because a man ain't there. So much that daughters have to experience because the man ain't there. So much that mothers, wives potentially, have to experience because the man ain't there. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. I don't want to say the man ain't there. I'm going to say the right man ain't there. I'll say it that way. Because you can have a warm body, and sometimes you'd be blessed more if he was out of the picture because he's leading people astray. But there's so much that takes place that ordinarily would not take place if there were a godly man in the home. I've told this example, and I'm going to put Ephesians 6 and 4 in proper context as well. I've told this example about my daughter Kennedy in the eighth grade. Her Spanish teacher winked at her. And we're sitting at the table, and she's oh, don't worry, Dad, in her eighth grade mind, thinking she's making it better. Oh, he does that to all the girls. What? What? Oh, uh-uh. No, 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 no. Went down there. Me and Mr. So-and-so had to have a conversation. And I talked to him kindly, but yet directly. I said, I don't, I don't expect that to happen anymore. In a time where teachers are involved in sexual affairs with kids, at a time with sexual immoralities at an all-time high, and in that context, as a professional, an educator, a teacher, you're going to wink at an eighth grade girl and think I'm not going to say nothing about it? No, sir. That's not supposed to happen. I said, please, sir. I didn't threaten him now. Don't get me wrong. But I spoke directly about my child and what he did regarding my child, which was inappropriate and crossed many lines. I said, don't let that happen again, sir. I said, that's not, that's not anything that you should even be involved in. But the point is, imagine if you didn't have a godly man in the picture, how that can spiral out of control. How many times has stuff like that spiraled out of control and predators or people with the wrong motivation do these little things to send these test balloons to see which way the wind is blowing and they can say, I did this, nobody said nothing. I did that, nobody said nothing. And it just grows and grows until you really have a problem in your hand. So fathers, to raise them, to teach them, the one thing you need to do is be there. 
Don't abandon your child. And while you are there, it doesn't mean you lean on them and exasperate your child. Don't break their spirit. Doesn't mean that you won't make decisions that a child won't like because a child is a child. The Bible says this, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. It just is. Foolishness is just bound up in their heart. They have no idea why you won't buy them a chainsaw for Christmas. And they just cry and cry and cry. Everybody else getting chainsaws. Why can't I have a chain? No, ma'am. No, sir. Not going to happen. So, yes, you may make decisions they won't like, they don't understand, or they don't agree with. That's not what this text is talking about. This is the intentional, willful, volitional, I'm going to take my bad day out on you because I know you can't do nothing about it. Why? Because I'm the father. That was the Greek and Jewish culture. But when you've been born again, you don't behave that way. And remember now, the chapter break, as we go from chapter five to chapter six, don't let the chapter break take your mind away from the fact that this is a discussion that began in chapter 5 and verse 18. In chapter 5, verse 18, it talks about living a spirit-filled life. And there's no way you can be a biblical man, a biblical father, a godly man, if you don't walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Don't try to not break your child's spirit by doing, doing it in your own effort, it still involves the Spirit's guidance. In chapter 5, verse 18, it talks about living a Spirit-filled life and all of the fruit that come from that. It talks about, in, the, in, in chapter 5, encouraging yourself. Then it goes on by saying, by the Spirit, you're giving thanks to God. By the spirit, you have a mutual submission in a marriage. By the spirit, wives submit to their husbands as the spirits, uh, as their spiritual head. By the spirit, husbands can love their wives the same way Christ loved the church. By the spirit, it said, love your wife the same way you love your own body. And by the spirit, you leave your mother and father and you cleave to your wife. Get mama and daddy out your business. You are a spirit-filled husband and father. You're a biblical man. Stop calling your mama every time you're mad at your wife. Stop calling your daddy every time you're mad at your wife. Learn to work that stuff out at home. You leave mama and daddy and now you cleave to your wife. Then the chapter breaks and we come to chapter number six. It says, children, guess what? You must be obedient to your parents. Why? Because this is just right. And then it says, fathers, in our current text right here, don't provoke your children to wrath. Don't provoke them. But raise them in the nurture and discipline of the Lord. A good thing that you can do, as we talk about biblical manhood, a good thing that you can do, not that you have to, just a tip that has worked for others, it even worked for me. Let me explain to you why I don't want you to do this. It's not just daddy's preference or your mother's preference. It's based on a biblical principle. You see, here's the principle right here. Here's God's standard. And dad is just trying to live up to this standard himself. And I'm trying to raise you to live up to this standard. The Bible says, listen, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together like some do. The Bible says that. And some people do forsake to go to church. They don't want to go to church. But listen, I'm trying not to do that. Some days I wake up, I'm sleeping. Some days I wake up, I'm tired. But guess what? God is worth it. If I go to work five days a week, I can go to church at least for a couple hours on Sunday. So the reason I'm making you go to bed and the reason I'm making sure you get up early and the reason I'm making sure you got your clothes out is because we're trying to raise you according to this biblical principle. You see, it's not just my preference, although I do prefer it. It's still my principle. You know, it's a biblical principle. Show them in the word. And guess what? That can go a long way in teaching them the Bible. This is why daddy don't want you dressed that way. I don't want you showing and exposing too much of what God has blessed you with. We live in a sex-filled culture. I'm trying to raise you to be godly women. We want you, according to Timothy, what Paul said to Timothy, to dress in modest apparel, 
Now, you can't hide the fact that you're a woman or a young girl. You can't hide the fact your body is different as a woman than it is to a man or a young kid to what it is to a young boy. It's just different. But you sure don't want to accentuate it with all the junk and stuff going on. In Let me show you. This comes from the Bible. These principles come from what God's word says. Friends, we need more of that in the homes. We need more of that in the church. We need more of that, in, Lord have mercy, in the school system. We need biblical men that love the Lord, that are going to do what is right in the face of controversy, that are going to love their families and lead their homes despite what other voices have to say, that are going to play a major part in biblically educating their own children. In turn, learning themselves and teaching the generation coming behind them. The least you can do is to show them what the Bible says, to teach them what God's word says. That's a far cry from the irresponsible man, the lazy man, the won't work man, the abusive man, the cussing man, the leaning on mama and other women man, the not respecting the mama man, the not taking care of his kids. That's a far cry from some of the junk we see that's prevalent in the culture. Let me encourage you, to our men, to everybody, but to our men specifically, let me encourage you. This is just what God has called us to do. We're not to dominate women. The Bible doesn't say that. You can't make a wife submit. That's not submission biblical. That's not biblical submission. That's condemned in the Bible, not condoned by the Bible. When Paul said, let the women learn, that is counter-cultural. When Paul says, fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath, that is counter-cultural. That goes against the grain of the society they were living in. Mm -mm. And God says, no, now that you're changed, as we would say it this way, now that you're saved, you ought to show some signs. So hopefully this has been beneficial to our men. Just wanted to be direct to the women. If nothing else, you know what to look for in the man. <laughs> if nothing else, you know what to look for in the man. And let me tell you now, I'm just going to leave you with this free tip. If he's got children, some prospective guy that says he likes you and he's pouring sugar in your ear, if he ain't taking care of the kids he already got, there's something wrong with that picture. You better examine him and scrutinize him thoroughly. If he's not taking care of the responsibilities he already has and talking about marrying you and y'all might potentially have kids, you may be looking at a picture of how he's going to do you based on what he's already been doing. I'm going to say amen for myself on that one. So I appreciate your time. I appreciate this. And, and, and let me just bring it all together by saying this. These things, as I alluded to earlier, they cannot be done without the help of the Lord. There's no way. If you're an unsaved person, you can try your best to fulfill these commands. You can do it to the best of your might. But human effort will never lead you to complete obedience to the Lord in any particular area. You see, these things can only be done by the power of the Lord living through you. The power of the Spirit walking, uh, living through you, shining through you. They can't be done by human effort. Your and my best effort are doomed to fail. With just a cell phone unplugged from a charger, it's only a matter of time before it goes out. It will only be a matter of time before we give out and we give over. But when you come to know Jesus, that man from Galilee, that man that came down through the 42 generation and was conceived in the womb of a virgin. We talked about that in Sunday school. That Jesus that lived for 33 years, that ministered publicly for three and a half years, he was hung on the cross and was crucified for the sins of the world. He shed his blood and he died to pay for all of our sins, past, present, and future. And if you put your hope in him, if you give your life and your heart to him, 
and repent of your sin and you have faith in Christ, not believing like a head knowledge, but you believe that Jesus did that for me while I didn't even follow him. He loved me that much. If you follow him to that degree, he can give you the strength to fulfill his command. He'll never call you to do what he does not equip you and encourage you to get done. Yeah, you'll make mistakes as a Christian father, as a biblical man also. But you still got somebody that can help you, that can push you, that can encourage you. And you'll find yourself becoming more and more obedient, not just as a biblical man and father and husband, but as a servant of his. And guess what else happens? You find yourself changing from the inside out. And you'll be able to say what you may have heard many seniors say in church so many times down the road. Not what I used to be or what I ought to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. So we invite you to give your life to him today. We're going to go ahead at this time and get started with our time of communion. And for those that have the communion packet, we encourage you to go ahead and get those ready. Uh, for those that don't have it, uh, these are only elements. I'm going to say to you, this is not real bread. This is not real wine. If you got some tea and a cracker, if you got some bread and some milk, if you got some bread and water, you can use what you have at home. The symbolism is what's important. And while you're getting that, I'm going to begin reading 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do this as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. And somebody out there knows he is coming again. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, not your neighbor, not your friend, but himself, and let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation to his own self, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, for the ones who eat and drink uh, undeservedly, unworthily, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. Jesus was hung on a cross and they beat him unmercifully. Let's take and eat his body together. And I've heard this saying, and at the risk of repeating myself, it still bears to be true. Salvation is free, but it's not cheap. It was paid for by the precious blood of Jesus. Let's commune with our Savior together. The song says, Jesus paid it all, and all to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain, and he washed me, and I became whiter than snow. We appreciate your time. We appreciate your support with your presence. We appreciate your support by tangibly giving to make sure that our ministries can continue to go forward as we try to minister in this time. So I pray that all of you have a wonderful day, a beautiful rest of this Sunday evening. For those of you who are retired, you certainly give me something to work for. And I thank the Lord for you. Certainly thankful that God has blessed you through two and three and possibly four decades of working. Started working as a young person. Now here you are at a certain age and you can relax and you can volunteer. You can do more for your church. You can do more for your family and around the house. We thank the Lord for you in that situation. For the ones who are getting ready to go to work, get you some rest. Be ready to meet that mule. Lord willing, come Monday morning. Be thankful you have a job. Unemployment lines are still long, and I'll tell you what, it's just by God's grace we have a job to go to and don't have to go out to the corner like some do. 
So we're thankful for all situations. God bless you. God keep you is my prayer. Enjoy the rest of your day.